You know those power stations with all the caution signs that are like, DANGER! HIGH LIKELIHOOD OF DEATH! Or like, have a picture of a skull or something? Yeah, I know I'd be lying if I said all those warnings didn't tempt my dark curiosity a bit, but I've never been inside one either. However, for the story I found this week, someone did go inside, or maybe that's what we're supposed to think. I'm Jason, and thanks for tuning in to Killer Bites. Our story begins in March of 2007. A Purdue University maintenance employee was doing his rounds in the laundry room. But when he was drying out the washing machines, he kept hearing this popping noise. And at first he thought it might be one of the machines going haywire or whatever, so he decided to check up on all of them in case there was like an electrical problem or something, you know? Well, that's the kind of sound it was, like a clipped wire or something, but all of the machines were working and the popping noise just kept buzzing in his ear. And he's like, am I going crazy? But once he actually leaves the laundry room, he hears that the popping sound is only getting louder. He's walking down the hall, taking his time to figure out where this is coming from, you know, like on his tiptoes, kind of creeping, until he finds himself in front of this padlocked door he'd never been inside of before in all the time he'd worked there. The sound was coming full blast now from the other side of this weird unmarked locked door, like bolted shut with multiple locks, bars, levers, the whole thing. You know, giving like creepy basement door vibes, like what monsters are they keeping in there? So he tries all his keys on the big maintenance keychain, and the last one he uses, he knows he hasn't used before. And he didn't even notice he had it until now, because nobody goes in there. When the janitor finally opens the door, he gets hit with the smell. You know which one I'm talking about, but it's like a barbecue, like someone had been cooking in there. Not hamburgers and hot dogs, like someone had been cooking in there. So he flips on the lights and the janitor doesn't find the hunchback of Notre Dame or anything like that, but it turns out the bolted up room is the transformer vault for the dormitory he's working in. And that's why there's so many locks on the door. Nobody is supposed to be in there. He noticed there was a door on the other side of the room that goes outside, but that's the only other way in. He knows now that the popping noise is definitely coming from here. So he peeks around the corner of one of those huge power transformers to see the fried remains of a student stuck upright between two of the machines with his finger still plugged into an exposed electrical conduit. And the popping sound is coming from the sparks flying off of it and hitting the ground. So he calls the authorities and the coroner confirms that they found the body of freshman aviation student Wade Steffi, who had been missing for almost three months at this point after leaving a frat party in January and was last spotted trying to get into Owen Hall, which was not his own residence. So he didn't have a key. He was reportedly walking through the snow at 12.30 a.m. on January 13th, the last night he'd been seen, to get a jacket he'd accidentally left at a friend's dorm in that hall. So, what happened in the middle of the night in January up until the 16th of March to put Wade into this inaccessible transformer room? Let's dig in. January 12th, 2007 was a normal day for Wade. His friends corroborated that he was in class that day around 11.30 a.m. And he'd spent the afternoon with a new roommate looking at apartments for the next school year. He went back home around five o'clock and wasn't seen again until 7.20 p.m. or so when he had dinner with friends in the Ford Dining Hall, which is right between his own residence hall and the one they'd go to next, Owen Hall, to pregame for the Phi Kappa Theta frat party that night. Wade withdrew $50 from the ATM at the dining hall, but he didn't stop anywhere else before going to hang out at room 139 in Owen for about an hour before trekking out into the drizzly, hazy, 40 degree weather for their party around 10 o'clock. Nobody reported anything unusual was happening there. Yes, Wade was drinking and was drunk by the time he left based on the independent toxicology report, but he wasn't belligerent or completely out of his mind or anything. When he left around midnight, nobody even noticed he was gone. And this is where things get funny. According to cell phone records, Wade made six different phone calls as he worked his way back to room 139 to get his jacket. And Owen Hall is in a place between his own place and Phi Kappa Theta, so it makes sense that he'd want to stop and pick it up on the way, but after apparently calling a friend first to see what he was doing, he made three kind of random calls to people who wouldn't even be inside Owen Hall. 
A woman in Bloomington, Indiana stated to the FBI that a male caller she didn't know had asked her to open the front door that night, but she didn't recognize him and assumed it was a wrong number. Purdue is in West Lafayette, Indiana, so Bloomington is nowhere near the university, let alone Owen Hall itself. She later came to realize that her son had actually gone to high school with Wade, so this being 2007, you know, maybe Wade was calling his friend's old home phone line or something, and his friend might not even had a cell phone at that time. The next call he made was to a fax machine. Yes, remember those? Fax machine with an unidentified location. After that call was made, he made another call to a resident of Ellettsville, Indiana, and she also assumed it was a wrong number, but later determined that she'd met Wade Steffi in the past. His own dormitory is only a few yards from this one, and he did have a key to that building, so if he was just trying to escape the cold, why wouldn't he just leave his jacket there, go back home, and pick it up in the morning when he could easily get into Owen Hall? I can't help but think that maybe he's making calls for different reasons, especially if he's dialing numbers he knows enough to not be completely random, but not people who he knows are inside the hall to let him in. The fourth call he made is the most mysterious with absolutely no information about it besides the time that it was placed, 12.29 a.m. that night. Apparently, investigators couldn't find any information about it, which is kind of a trend in this investigation because throughout the weeks-long search for Wade, authorities never found his body inside the transformer vault, even after a visual inspection made of the vault during that search, where it supposedly had been for the entire 10-week period he was missing. So he makes this mysterious fourth call, and apparently it wasn't to anyone inside Owen Hall who could have opened the door, because he called someone who did live in the hall a couple minutes later, but there was no answer. This is where the last couple witnesses saw Wade alive for the last time. A resident had observed Wade attempting to gain entry into the dorm, but didn't let him in because he was trying the door to the women's side of the hall, and she thought he appeared intoxicated, so refused to let him enter. Maybe like a hold the door for me type situation and she decided not to. Well, around that same time, another resident spotted him talking on his cell phone and appeared to her to be intoxicated as well. But no records of this phone call survived because we don't have any information about who he had actually reached on the phone and was now talking to. This was the last witness and the last call. So when his current roommate returns home from the Martin Luther King holiday three days later and discovers that nobody has seen Wade since the 13th, he reports Wade missing. And authorities undertake a citywide search that includes university police, local police, a missing child organization, and even the FBI. What they found, I think, is the strangest evidence in this case. Wade's shoes that weren't on his feet when they found his body wedged between the Transformers, sock-footed. While authorities searching on the 18th didn't find anything unusual about the Transformer vault. A community member on the search found one of his shoes outside the exterior door to the vault, the one on the other side of the room from the entrance that the janitor had used from inside the hall. But this shoe was not recovered until five days after the search team originally checked the vault, when another maintenance worker was cleaning the little fenced off section in front of that exterior door. They didn't identify it as Wade's shoe at the time, and remember, they hadn't found Wade's body inside the Transformer room, so I guess they figured it was just a random shoe that got swept into this little exterior, fenced-off area. Weird, but okay. So if you're wondering why Wade would have taken his shoes off just to go into a side entrance of the building in below-freezing, rainy weather, well, you're not alone, because <laughs> wondering the same thing over here. And to add another pinch of mystery to this clue, there are conflicting reports about whether his other shoe was recovered at all. Just missing shoe somewhere. Maybe just someone found a shoe and decided one's good enough. Who knows? Some articles indicate that his other shoe was found inside the transformer room in a corner, but the official investigation doesn't report that his other shoe was found at all just the one outside the transformer room and that he wasn't wearing either of them on his body when it was recovered nine weeks later. So after the coroner's report rules that Wade died instantly from an electrical shock between 2,000 and 4,000 volts, which entered through his ring finger and exited through his left hand and thigh, and to give you some perspective, uh, an electric chair uses about 2,000 volts in execution, so 
big blast here. The FBI conducted an investigation of the Transformer Vault security standards in parallel with a third-party investigation hired by the university. While both investigations ruled that the vault was functioning up to state codes, the exterior door could appear locked visually, but only took some minor shaking for the lock to fail and someone to gain access. To investigators, this was ample evidence that Wade, desperate to access the building, had found the side entrance and was able to open the door to the dark transformer vault and, intoxicated, Wade was groping around for a light switch when he accidentally inserted his finger into the open conduit and was killed instantly. An accidental death was ruled to be the fault of Purdue University's poorly functioning locks and resulted in a $500,000 settlement for Wade's family. However, this doesn't seem to completely answer questions about why Wade was so desperate to get his jacket that he'd break into the maintenance entrance of the building when he could have been warm inside his own dorm a few yards away and waited to get it in the morning. Not to mention the fact that he took off both of his shoes. The investigation ruled that he'd removed one to wedge inside the exterior door in case he got locked inside or maybe for a light or something, but what about the other shoe? I mean, why would he take off both of them in the freezing cold? With all parties satisfied with these conclusions, the investigation to his death has ended, but what do you think? Why do you think the search party was unable to find him in the Transformer room if he'd been in there the whole time? And why would he have taken his shoes off in this freezing cold weather? Who was he trying to reach on the phone? And did he reach who he wanted to in the end and stop making calls? And what about the $50 he withdrew from the ATM? Wade was on a full ride scholarship for aviation engineering, so he must have been pretty smart. Do you think this is a drunken accident like the university said? Or was Wade involved with another clever student or worker who would have known exactly how to stage his death to make it look like an accident? Let us know your theory in the comments. What kind of evidence could have turned this case on its head and made these outlying clues make sense? Thanks for watching Killer Bites. See you again soon. And be careful the next time you're locked out. It might be better just to come back the next day.